Well, today we're going to talk about building wealth that lasts. Building wealth that lasts. I heard a story about a man that was very wealthy, and uh, he had bought a racehorse, and he was bragging everywhere he went that this racehorse was going to win the Kentucky Derby. Uh, he's just kind of an obnoxious about it. So he stops and gets gas and goes to this little country store, and there's a man that owned it that he had a reputation that every time that someone bought something, he would quote a Bible verse. And uh, if, a, if a young couple was in there, he would say, Proverbs says, a man who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. If he saw a mom in there with a little baby, he said, he quotes Psalms. He says, Psalm says that children are a blessing from the Lord. Well, this very wealthy horse owner came into the uh, the store, and he was bragging about his horse. And he looked at the man. And he said, "Do you have anything that I could purchase for my horse?" He said, "Well, I think I've got a horse blanket in the back. And let me go check." So he goes back, and sure enough, he had one horse blanket in this little country store. And he comes out, and he says, uh, "Here's what I've got. That'll be fifty dollars." The guy looked at him, offended. He's like, "Did you not hear what I said?" I said, this is going to win the Kentucky Derby. Nothing but the best for my horse. If you don't have anything better than this, just keep it. The guy said, oh, I misunderstood you. He said, let me go back and see what else I got. He goes back, the exact same blanket. He brings it out again. He said, well, this one is better, I think. He said, so this one is $100. The guy looked offended again. He said, you are not listening to me. I believe this is going to be one of the greatest horses ever. Nothing but the best. If you don't have anything better than that, then I'm leaving. And the guy said, oh, okay, I finally understand what you're saying. He goes back into the back and comes out with the exact same horse blanket. He's holding it like it's some valuable treasure. He said, mister, he said, this is the best I've got. And if you're not willing to take this, you won't be able to buy anything from me. And the guy looked at him, he said, how much is that blanket? He said, this blanket, it's the finest that I have. It's $10,000. That guy looks at him, he slaps his hands. He said, that's what I'm talking about. Only the best for my horse. And so everybody that knew the guy, they were watching him. They said, what is he, what kind of Bible verse is he going to quote when he rings this guy up? The guy stood there for a minute, just kind of looking off into the distance He says, Matthew says, a stranger came unto me, and I took him in. So (laughs) what we're talking about today is we're talking about how you are not going to be taken in by the lies of the enemy concerning money and the world's philosophy of money. Now, here's the thing. Uh, Concerning possessions and money, the devil tells you that your value is based on how much money how much power, how much prestige, or how much talent you have. But God says that your value is based on what Jesus was willing to pay for you. And so there are a lot of people that have the wrong philosophy when it comes to money and possessions. The world says that your happiness, your contentment, your significance, and your self-worth is based on your net worth. But God says you should not have such a small view of your value, that you should not have such a small view of yourself. Well, to understand what we're going to read today, we first need to understand what Jesus was not saying. Now, in this series, Embrace the Mess, we've been looking at words that Jesus actually taught. And we've been in the book of Matthew. And so I want to just kind of give you a foundation before we read this to understand what Jesus was not saying. Okay? It's very important. He was not saying that being poor is godly. There is nothing godly about being poor. There's nothing godly about being rich either. It's just one or the other. But uh, that's not what Jesus was teaching. To understand Scripture, you've got to compare all of Scripture. So he was not saying that we should fail to plan. Or that we should fail to save. Or that we should fail to manage our money. He was not saying that at all. In fact, what he was saying was basically that money is a tool. 
Now, I hear people misquote the scripture. That, I hear this all the time. Money is the root of all evil. Well, that's not what the Bible says. You see, money is simply a tool. Now, a tool is neither good nor evil, all right? A tool is simply to be used for a purpose. Now, can you misuse a tool? Can you use a tool for the wrong purpose? Absolutely. But the value of a tool and the purpose of a tool can only be fulfilled by the person that wields that tool. And in the same way, uh, the Bible says, guys, I'm ringing a little bit here. Can y'all fix that for me. It's, uh, it, there we go. Thank you so much. So the Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, that word love, it means the, inord- the inordinate love of money. So it's not saying that being happy with something that God provides for you is wrong. What he's saying is that greed is wrong. What he's saying is that being Uh, driven by and possessed by money and possessions, that is what is wrong. And the Bible does tell us this, that every good gift comes from God. And so that includes our finances, our job, our health, our possessions. So everything good comes from God. In fact, Jesus himself said this. He said, if you, being evil, know how to give gifts to your children... How much more will the Heavenly Father give, and this is the word that Jesus used, good gifts, good things to his children, to those who love him. Now, understand this. There are four admonitions concerning money and possessions from the Bible. Um, This is not in the outline, so if you want to jot this down, you can. There are four, at least four. There are probably many others. But there are four admonitions that we must heed. Number one is you must have contentment. Contentment. God wants you to be content with what he has. Have you ever noticed that for some, and in fact, I believe the temptation is great for all of us, that the more we get, the more we want, that we're never content. Now, don't misunderstand what contentment means. It does not mean that if you own a business that you should not want your business to perform well, or that it's not wrong for you as a business owner to have a goal to make more money this year than you did last year. There's, that's not what contentment means. Uh, the word contentment doesn't mean that you don't ever want to get ahead at work. It doesn't mean that you don't want to raise or that you don't want a promotion. That's not what contentment means. Contentment means looking to God and understanding that what he has given us is enough. What he has given us in Jesus Christ, especially, is more than enough. And so if I am content, it means that I'm okay if I don't get a bigger house. It doesn't mean that you should just simply um, ignore, uh, you know, getting a car that works and drive back and forth to work. That's not what it means. Being content, however, is what God has called us to do and to be as believers concerning our money. Here's a second admonition. It is that we be thankful. Give thanks. Give thanks. Understand that God is the one that provides. Now, does God want you to partner with him? Absolutely. I remember when I was in college, we would have uh, devotions at night in the dorm where we lived, and there would always be guys that would say, uh, pray that I get a job, pray that I get a job. I don't have a job. Pray that I get a job. And I found that not only did I pray that I would get a job, but I actually went out and looked for a job, and I got a job because I went out and looked for a job. And I, I found that a lot of these guys that were praying and praying and praying and praying just simply never looked, okay? So it doesn't mean that, um, that God doesn't want you to participate or that he doesn't want you to try or that he doesn't want you to work. There's so much in the Bible about managing money, earning money, and so, but he wants us to be thankful. And then the third admonition is that we practice generosity. Uh, The Bible is very clear that when you love, you're going to give. And being generous as a believer is at the heart of making an impact 
for the kingdom of God. So be generous. Be generous. And then the fourth admonition is this. Allow our wealth, money, or possessions to stir us to worship God. And if you are not worshiping God because of the good blessings that he has given you, you have the wrong attitude about money. It doesn't matter if you have a little bit or a lot. It doesn't matter if you're poor by some people's standards or rich by some people's standards. By the way, did you know that worldwide, if you own a car, if you have a car to drive, then you're in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world. Did you know that if you have the average household income of our area, this part of Georgia, that you're in the top 1% of the wealthiest people in the world? We all hear about the one percenters, right? Oh, the one percenters, the one percenters. Well, I just want you to know that even though you may feel like that you're broke, and even though that you may feel like you don't have much, because you live in this country, you're in the top one, most people are in the top 1% of the wealthiest people in the world. And so what God wants us to do is make sure that our possessions stir us to worship God. They should stir us to worship God. So when you get a new car, that should stir you to worship God. That's kind of hard if you're upside down on a payment to worship God, but that's a subject of a different message, all right? So what we must do is make sure that we worship God because of his good blessings in our life. Now, I want you to understand that what we're going to read today, Jesus is not giving financial advice, but heart instruction. Okay, Jesus was not saying, uh, stop by my office and I'm going to put together a portfolio that's going to help you manage your money. That's not what he's teaching. He was talking about rather the heart that we have that focuses or is tempted to focus only on temporal things. And is your job important? Yes. Is money an important tool for your life? Absolutely. In fact, Jesus talked about it more than any other subject. The Bible talks about money more than any other topic, and many of these most important topics in our life more than all those put together. So God does not deny the importance of money and possessions. He shows us that our heart, however, must be right. So I want you to look at what Jesus said about building wealth that lasts with me from Matthew chapter 6. Um, beginning in verse 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. By the way, this is about your perception. This is about how you want other people to see you. And if you are so desperate for people to see you in a certain light, you need to check your heart. There are some people that will spend more money than they have just to be, they want to look like a $40,000 a year millionaire. Do you know what I'm talking about? They make $40,000 a year, but they want to drive like a millionaire. They want to live like a millionaire. And so that's what these people were doing. He says, thus when you give to the needy, Sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Now you say, what in the world does that mean? Sound a trumpet before you. Did you know that in Jesus' day, the wealthy would often hire dancers or musicians to go before them when they gave in the offering at the synagogue or the temple? Can you imagine that? Dun, 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 dun. Here comes Richie to give his money. I don't know what kind of song they sang. But Jesus said, stop that nonsense. It's not about what you think other people think about you. He said, truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And notice this last sentence. Your father who sees in secret will reward, reward you. So here's the first word I want you to get. It's the word reward. God rewards generosity that comes from the right, right motive. I heard one preacher say, uh, we want you to have a happy heart when you give, but we'll take it from a grouch, right? Uh, but God's saying that, uh, you know, what we need is people that have the right heart motive. What you need is the heart motive. And because you gave, 
you get rewarded. Can I just say this? Because somebody gave, we're able to have church. Because somebody gave, we have children that come to know Jesus and follow uh, in baptism in this church. Because somebody gave, we have middle school and high schoolers that are following Jesus Christ. Because somebody gave, there are people that get saved here at Avalon Church. Because somebody gave, uh, you're able to see people in this church that have had their marriages restored and their mental health restored and their blessings restored. Why? Because somebody was generous and had the right motive in giving. And so God promises to reward those that have the right motive. When I was 16 years old, I went to a summer camp. It was a Christian camp. And um, I had really two motives for going. One was to play basketball, and the other was to meet girls. All right, so that's really the only reason I wanted to go to camp. It was because of the girls, and I got to play sports while I was there. Well, while I was there, it's a Christian camp, and this church had invested all this money into this camp. And it was there that I committed my life to Jesus Christ to serve him with my life. I went forward during the, the message time in the camp services. And I was already a Christian. I'd already been saved. But it was at that camp that I said yes to God's will for my life. And became a person that surrendered to the ministry. Now you know why, indirectly, why this church exists? Do you know why we're able to see people saved here at this church? Eh, it's not because of me. I get it. It's because of Jesus. But you know why I've been able to lead this church for 20 years? You know why? Because somebody gave. You don't know them. You've never met any of them. Most of them that gave to start that are probably dead now. But they will receive a reward. And so no, the first word is the word reward, that God will reward you when you have the right attitude toward money. Let's read on. Uh, uh, verse 19 and 21, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where uh, thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where, the, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The, the second word I want you to see is the word treasure. What do you treasure? What's important to you? Well, it's, of course, it's important for us to have food and clothing and shelter and, uh, and, and so forth. But what do you really treasure? If you show me where your money goes, I'll show you what your treasure is, what your heart does. I, I've got some pictures that I want to show you. This morning, um, I had a board meeting for Ndawa Yatimba, which is the children's village in uh, South Africa that our church helped start um, and that we support more than any other church. Um, and and uh, Bob and Joanna Graham, friends of ours, that they are doing a great, great job. I had a board meeting this morning through Zoom. And uh, we found out how they're doing. This is a picture of the, the grannies and the children and some of the workers there in the children's village. You'll notice that there are a lot of teenagers in that picture now. They're getting older. Most of these kids came to Endowia Temple, which, by the way, means place of hope in Zulu. Um, most of these kids came there as little orphaned children. All of them were orphaned. Their parents were dead. Majority of these kids were in what is called child-led homes. In other words, um, their, both of their parents were dead and there was an underage child that was leading that home, sometimes 10 years old. And so these children were uh, adopted uh, through the program that we have there. It's a wonderful, wonderful program. And uh, a lot of these kids have gotten older. And I want to show you a picture of Ayanda. Ayanda here is around 20 years old now. And she came there. She is going to college. And uh, she is just going to make an impact for Jesus Christ there 
in South Africa. Let me tell you a little story about her because I want you to understand where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Ayanda was found in a field when she was about 18 months old. There was a helicopter that was flying over and they just happened to see a child lying in the middle of a field. Well, obviously they stopped and they, they got her and rescued. She was almost dead. And this little girl at 18 months old had been raped and left for dead. She had no hope. There was no hope for her future. There was no hope for her education. There was really even no hope for her salvation. There was no hope for her life. But then, Ndawi Yatimba got involved. But then, Avalon Church got involved. And because you gave... This young woman now is going to college. She's been saved. She's graduated high school. What am I saying? What is your heart treasure? What do you treasure? That's what Jesus is saying, that what you and I need to learn is that what we treasure matters and how we live matters. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. Here's the third word I want you to write down, the word perspective. Perspective. Do you realize that when you get God's perspective on your money, on the material possessions, on the fact that this world is temporary, that eternity is forever. Uh, When you get God's perspective, it changes everything about you. I grew up in North Carolina. Most of you know that. Uh, Close to where I grew up, there was a man, I won't say his name, uh, but he was an old farmer. And he lived to almost 100 years old. And I remember my dad and I would sit on his porch and talk to him about the Bible and talk to him about Jesus. And we found out a lot of things about this man. He was a multi-millionaire. And yet he didn't even have plumbing in his house. He was a multi-millionaire and had owned one car in his life. And he bought it brand new. And I'm not even really sure what year it was. I think it was in the 1920s. And he was driving it home, and he lost control and ran into a tree, dented the fender, and he got out, and he started walking home, and the very first person he saw, he handed him the keys and said, would you like a car? And they said, yes, and he gave it to him, and he never owned a car after that. He drove a tractor wherever he would go. This was a man that, according to the stories that we were told, uh, was such a miser, was so tight that he would keep his money in milk pails that you'd use to milk cows with. And the story goes that he walked into a bank um, and had a milk pail with a covering over it. And he said, I'd like to see the bank president. And they didn't think he had time for that. And the guy was like, they just kind of dismissed him. Well, he left that bank and walked into another bank with his milk pail And it's told, and I don't think he probably had this much money in there, but this is the story, that he had $100,000 in cash in 1927 in the milk pail covered over with a towel. Now, I looked it up. The value of that in today's money would be over $16 million. And he says, may I see the bank president? And they said, sure. He goes in. He sets the milk pail on the, guy's, uh, on the guy's desk. And the guy says, what are you doing? And he uncovered it. And he had all this money. He said, I'd like to make a deposit into your bank. Now you say, why would you tell that story? Well, because this man had the wrong perspective on money. Not that he had money. Not that he didn't have indoor plumbing. Not that he only had one car in his life. But as we would talk to him, he really began to believe, he began to tell us 
that there was no hope, that even though he said he read the Bible every day of his life, he did not believe that anyone could be saved. He did not believe there was hope for anyone. And he lived his entire life with millions of dollars and zero hope. Now, I can say, honestly, that's the wrong perspective to have. On the other hand, there's a man that was my best friend at the time, and his name was Kenny. And before we ever started this church, he knew that we were praying about this church. And Kenny had been blessed by God. Uh, He had a great job. He made a lot of money. He had a business on the side. Uh, He was uh, just doing very, very well. And uh, God blessed him. And the more money he made, the more generous he became. And I'll never forget it. We were living in Jonesboro at the time. And he rang my doorbell, and I went to the front door. And I said, hey, Kenny, what are you doing, man? Good to see you. Come on in. He goes, no, I don't have much time. He said, but I would like to give you something. And he handed me a check for $10,000, which was the very first seed money to start this church. $10,000. Now, about a year after that, I had to preach Kenny's funeral. He died in a car accident. Had no idea that he was entering into the last phase of his life. He was my friend. We did lots of stuff together. But here's what I know. He sowed seeds and had the right perspective on money. God blessed him. The more he gave, the more God blessed him. And he would say, you can't outgive God. And that was true. Now, what is my point? Well, you and I need to learn that we need to have the right perspective on money. Because guess what? Only what you send ahead is going to last forever. I don't care how much you earn. I don't care how much you have in the bank. You ain't taking none of it with you. Pardon my grammar, but embrace my theology. I've done a lot of funerals in my life. I've never seen a U-Haul trailer pulled behind a hearse. You know why? Because you ain't taking it with you. I mean, I, I, I really want you to understand what God wants us to learn is to have perspective on money. And then here's the last one, uh, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, you cannot serve God and money. Actually, the word in older translations is translated mammon. Mammon was the Babylonian god of wealth and significance and power and prestige and what happened was in that culture just as in our culture they thought that in order to have power in order to have significance in order to have contentment in order to have prestige you had to have a lot of money and you know what Jesus is teaching us it doesn't matter how much you have in the bank account your worth is beyond measure to God he was willing to give his only son to die for you that's how much you're worth to him so it doesn't matter if you drive a brand new car or not doesn't matter if you live in a brand new home or not doesn't matter if you've got a lot of money in the bank or not doesn't matter now should you work for retirement yes we've already discussed that but the point is this service He said, you cannot serve God and money. So here's the question. Is your money serving you or are you serving your money? He says, you cannot give your heart wholeheartedly, devotedly to two. Now, he's not saying you can't have money and serve God. He's not saying you can't be rich and serve God. That would be untrue because we know in the Bible there are many rich people that serve God incredibly well and there were many poor people that served God incredibly well it's not about your financial status it's not about how much money you have the question is is your money serving you or are you serving your money the fact is that's probably both a practical and a spiritual question I mean if you're living from paycheck to paycheck and you're living on credit card debt 
and uh, you're just living beyond your means, well, you're serving your money. And if you are at the point where if you missed a day of work, you would be in danger of going bankrupt, you don't have enough margin in your life. And I'm, I'm not talking about people that have lost their jobs. I'm, I'm, look, the fact is that we all know there are extenuating circumstances, but for most of us, do you know why we get in financial trouble? Because we spend more than we make. And, and so the question is, are you paying 28% interest, serving your money, getting further and further into debt, getting further and further behind, having less and less margin in your life? Or are you investing? Are you saving? Look, maybe it's the lifestyle. Maybe you don't need a brand new phone every year or two. Just saying. Maybe when I was a younger man, I had to have a new car, or at least new-ish. But every couple of years, I would trade mine in, get a new car. And God really began to convict me of that, and I began to see the foolishness of that. And you know what I learned? That it doesn't matter what kind of car I drive. I've got one vehicle that I've owned for 14 years. Still driving it. It's still kicking. It doesn't get very good gas mileage, so I bought... Um, I bought from my sister a 2004, back in at Thanksgiving, a 2004 uh, Honda CRV uh, that has rust on the side that I used uh, silver paint to cover over. And uh, it had 100,000 miles, great condition. And I reduced my gas, my, what I pay for gas, by about two thirds driving back and forth to work. Now, I've already, since Thanksgiving, made more savings in gas that I buy than the car costs me. I only paid $3,700. Here I am. I'm 57 years old. Can I afford a new car? Yes. And I'm driving a 2004 Honda CRV back and forth to work. I know some of our staff are probably embarrassed of that. Maybe not. But I know nobody wants to ride in that car with me because Besides me, the only other people that ride in that, or the only other things that ride in that, are my two dogs, all right? Now, what am I saying? I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to blow up, you know, that as an example. I just want you to understand, you can either have your money work for you, or you can work for your money. Uh, you can either, there's only really two ways to get out of debt and create margin, make more money, and spend less. It's the only two possible ways. Get more money and spend less. And I believe that you should look at both. You know, uh, my wife and I, uh, for years, we've had what I would call a side hustle. My wife, she has a degree in piano pedagogy. Doesn't that sound so sophisticated? Uh, but she has, for years, taught piano kind of as a side business. Um, we've made money from book sales. We've made money from um, other investments that we've made. We just started another business this past year, just a little side thing. You say, why do you do that? Because there's only two ways that you get out of debt, stay out of debt, save for the future. You make more money or you, and you spend less. And if you begin to do that, you know what's happening? You are having your money work for you. But really, the spiritual side of that question is this. Is your money working for you in eternity? The Bible teaches that when we give, we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. I'm going to ask our missions team that's going to Jacksonville, Florida, uh, today after the service. I'm going to ask if you would, all of you, wherever you are in the building, come on up. And uh, we want to have prayer over you. Here's the thing. We want our money as a church to work for us. And when we invest in the kingdom of God, we're putting, a, uh, we're, we're putting uh, people into heaven, if you will. And this team is going to Jacksonville, Florida. You guys, come on up. Um, we um, are supporting a man named Paul Scott who is planting a church in an underserved area of Jacksonville, Florida, a very needy area of Jacksonville, Florida. In fact, Paul was in my youth group when I was a youth pastor in Florida. He's uh, 49 or 50 years old now and starting this church. 
And what our team is doing is we are going down and we're working with the Boys and Girls Club there in Jacksonville where their church is going to be starting. It's going to be called 360 Church. And uh, so they're meeting now. And what our team is going to do is we're going down to help the Boys and Girls Club. You say, how does that help start a church? Because we're creating evangelism events and that's where this church is going to meet. He's already got a relationship and we're creating goodwill. And we are actually having our team going to go work on the Boys and Girls Club, do some repairs, do some stuff. And then they're going to do some programming for the kids from the Boys and Girls Club this week while they're there. And then uh, we have Bible studies set up and all this kind of stuff. And they even have a trip to the beach planned. All right, so just so you know, it's not going to be all work and no fun, but they are going to go down and make a huge impact uh, for this church. So I want you to be praying for 360 Church because what we want to do is to make our money as a church work for us. In other words, uh, we're not selling products. We're talking about eternal life. We want to put people in heaven, and that's what we're doing with this team. And so, uh, maybe in the future, you'd like to go on a missions trip, and I think it would be wonderful. Like I said, I talked to the Children's Village in South Africa this morning, and Bob is desperately asking anybody that will to come to South Africa, and uh, it just encourages them, and it helps them. And so, uh, we want to continue to do these kind of things, and so as a church, we want to pray and ask God to bless them, okay? Would you pray with me? We want to pray over this week that they have safety going down and that uh, they have an impact while they're there and they have safety coming back. Heavenly Father, we pray now for this team of people that's going to be going to Jacksonville. Um, God, that you just give them safety, empower them. Give them divine opportunities. Give them divine appointments as they go to serve this church and to serve that community and to make an impact. Lord, I know that there are going to be children in this Boys and Girls Club that need Jesus. Their family needs Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you just give us those divine appointments to be able to help them and to point them to Christ and for Paul to be able to reach their families as he starts this church. I pray that you give them safety coming back. I pray that you give them impact while they're there. And God, we want you to know that we love you. We appreciate you. And we thank you for giving us this opportunity. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to hang out after service with the deacons and elders and this team. And uh, we're going to be feeding them and sending them off uh, to have a safe journey to Jacksonville, Florida today. Amen. How many of you are going to pray for them uh, as they go down? All right. God bless you. Uh, thank you, guys. You can uh, go ahead and have a seat. Let me finish my prayer time. I always like to give an opportunity for people to receive Christ. If you've not done that and you would like to do that, maybe somebody's been praying for you, maybe the Holy Spirit is dealing in your heart, I would encourage you to open your life to Jesus Christ. All you've got to do is ask. God says that he'll answer. And so you ask. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're online, pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I invite you into my life. I ask you to save me right now. And at the bottom, if you'll hit the button that says, I pray to receive Christ. If you're in the room today and you want to receive Christ, or you just prayed along with me, or you just said, yes, that's what I want, God, then take the next step card, put your information on it, and drop it in the box on the way out today. We're going to be baptizing on Easter weekend. What a great opportunity. What, can you imagine? You'll never forget that. I was baptized on Easter. Can you imagine that? Um, and so if you need to be baptized, we encourage you to go ahead and do that. On Easter weekend, we've got people that we're lining up now. And we're also going to have a spontaneous response for anybody that gets saved on that Sunday that, or, and Saturday that want to be baptized. So be praying about that. Um, and so um, anyway, sign up. Make sure that you uh, communicate with us through this card and let us know uh, that you are here today. Let's everyone stand together. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for joining us online today. Let's continue to pray for this team as they go to Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and I believe that they'll make a great impact 
for the kingdom of God. I love you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.